If you've ever flown to another continent, you've probably wished you had arrived before your plane even got close to landing. Because once you have your ticket and you find your seat, there's nothing left to do. And being strapped in a seat for hours on end is boring. But is what's true of airline travel also true of our journey of faith? After we have obtained our ticket of salvation, is God asking us to sit passively in our assigned seats until our arrival in heaven? If you're not sure, then keep listening, because this week, Nathan, Vicki, and Kent will be learning from Abraham's life what God wants us to do this side of eternity. Welcome to Crosstalk a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the book of Genesis. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to Genesis chapter 12, as we join their discussion. Nathan, Vicki, like me, I'm sure you would agree that the most important decision you've made in life is to trust Christ for your salvation. Do you remember a time when um, you made that decision or when you were sure you'd made it? I don't because I think my parents just, uh, you know, they told me I was like four when I accepted Christ. So okay. I, I can't go back in time and verify that. I think maybe they were just like, well, maybe he'll just think he is and can't do anything <laughs> bad. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I think I seriously did make a commitment as as much as I could then. And really when I was, I want to say 15 years old, I had been going through a childhood illness throughout much of my teenage years and was depressed and suicidal even. Mm. Wow. And in the midst of that just absolute darkness, everything from going to church, everything from my childhood came flooding back, and I realized that I needed Christ to get me out of this situation. And so I think that's really where the gospel seed took root, and I, I fully committed my life to him and to follow him uh, all the days of my life. Hmm. I was saved really young, like maybe three, but I remember <laughs> when I was the ripe old age of five, I heard a magician speak at a conference, and I really do think I was already saved, but I wanted to make certain. Mm -hmm. So I would say maybe five, three, four, five, something like that. Yeah, for me, I was probably a young teen and uh, grew up in the church. Uh, so I had heard the gospel many times, but one night an evangelist uh, in the church that we were visiting presented the gospel and the Holy Spirit just worked. And suddenly it became clear I'm sure I must have heard it clearly before, but that night it really hit home. And I remember thinking, I got to get this done right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a it was a transformative moment. Mm -hmm. But for all of us, whether it was kind of in a moment or over time, once you know you've made that decision and that God has adopted you as his child and you are declared holy and righteous, I mean, really, is there... Is it impossible to improve that relationship that we have with God? I mean, God's son died so we could have a, a wonderful relationship with him. So what could we do to improve on what Christ did? Well, I don't think that's exactly the right question. I remember hearing my dad say, there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. There is mm -hmm. nothing you can do to make God love you less. God just loves you. <laughs> but like any relationship, you can be with someone, you can enjoy someone, you can get to know someone. And the more you, you often when you're with someone that you enjoy, your relationship strengthens and deepens. Uh, sometimes it doesn't go that way. Sometimes you're with someone and they just drive you up a wall. But, you know, if it's someone you enjoy and they love you and you love them, it strengthens and deepens. And that's like, like that with God. Yeah. Amen. So he makes it possible for a relationship to be there. And he's given us every advantage, but we have the opportunity to cultivate that relationship, right? Yes. To grow it and develop it. I mean, that's a wonderful thing that we have. In my mind, you know, the day that I accepted Christ as my Savior, obviously a pivotal day, but pivotal in the same way that my wedding day 
was a pivotal day in my relationship with my wife. I mean, obviously that was critical. That's what got it started. That's that's where our journey as husband and wife began. But that doesn't mean there's no work left to do on a marriage. <laughs> that doesn't mean that the relationship is fully bloomed. Um, no, I think every everyone would say that uh, marriage is work. Uh, wouldn't you agree? I oh, would. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Marriage is always work. In fact, uh, my wife has wanted a backsplash put up in our kitchen. So I've done all the hard work of doing that. I've got everything up. And today I was uh, grouting on my day off. Yeah, so I'm working on this. And she was teaching in the other room. And as soon as she was off with her students, I yelled over, all right, change your clothes. I need your help right now. <laughs> just to be clear you were grouting not grumbling is that correct uh, i was doing both actually oh i see I'm simultaneous <laughs> <laughs> and so you know i was i was i was very grouchy with her and, and at the beginning as i'm stressed out over the thing but you know i was going on we're talking I, thank you for doing this i love you i apologize for being grouchy with you thank you uh it takes work and you got to swallow your pride sometimes that's absolutely true yeah, I think the same thing happens in our relationship with God. As I mentioned, yes, our conversion is a starting point of our spiritual life. But our faith needs to um, be constantly developing. And we see this in the life of Abraham. I mean, if you've been with us uh, the past few weeks, you'll know that Abraham's journey of faith began back in Genesis 12, when Abram, as he was known then, demonstrated his trust in God by leaving his home in Haran. I mean, that was, a, that was a huge deal. The Lord said to him, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Give up everything you hold dear and go where I'm being indefinite about the location. And in verse 4 of chapter 12, we read that Abraham went, as the Lord had told him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. And he took Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his possessions, and uh, they set out for the land of Canaan. I mean, I think we would agree that was the pivotal moment of Abram's uh, relationship with God. That's where it started, right? That was the starting point of his journey of faith. Yep. But notice as well, then when we come to chapter 17 that we're going to be looking at today, that journey of faith didn't end there. Didn't end when he was packing up to leave from Haran. Vicki, would you mind reading for us um, the first few verses of chapter 17? Sure. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully. Be blameless. And then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Yeah, so I find that fascinating. Notice how um, the narrator keeps telling us Abram's age. So this is now 24 years that Abram has walked with God, 24 years. And God comes to him and says, let me remind you of the covenant I've made with you. Because what he says is not significantly different than the covenant he's made earlier. But he comes and says, now I want something else. I want you, and we'll see later for Sarai, I want you and your wife to change your names. From uh, Sarai to Sarah, there's not a lot of difference that I'm told in the Hebrew between the two, except that with Sarah, it is a more prestigious way to state the name. So it's someone almost of nobility. So you might almost say there was um, Lady Diana, and there was uh, Princess Diana. Hmm. And that change in title means, boy, you're, you're a lady over a significant realm. It's like she went from being called Katie to Catherine. Ooh, yeah, that's good. 
for Abram to Abraham, father of many, his name got changed to Abraham, father of many nations. So hmm. that's a that's a that's a big change for a guy with no kids. Oh yeah. <laughs> So, so, I mean, why does God say you you got to change your name? I mean, my name on my birth certificate was the same before and after my salvation. So, why why is he changing his name, especially after he's been walking with God for twenty four years? What's God trying to accomplish here? Well, there's an identity issue, right? Your your parents are the ones who name you, and, and that's yeah. it. You know, your parents name you; they give you your name, and God is not only reiterating what he's going to do, but it's it's a deeper, more intimate moment where I, I am your heavenly father mm. and I'm giving you this name. Well, would, would their friends and neighbors know about God's promise and would they know the meaning of Abraham and Sarah? Mm. They would certainly know the meaning because that's, that's what the word means. So, yeah. so yes, they would have understood the significance of the change of names. Hey well, boss, that, why'd you change your that, name? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. That would just put it out there for everybody. Well, yeah, I think that's the point. There is an identity factor here. I own you. I have the right uh, as your father, a heavenly father, but as your father to change your name. So there is that. And I think we see that numerous times in the Bible. But if you think about it, this name change is an act of faith. So no longer will you be called Abram, it says in verse 5, your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Mm. I have made you. How many kids does he have so far? None. Goose egg. I have made you. I think this is an act of faith because back in chapter 15, remember, Nathan, you talked about the, the fire pots and God walking between. He made that solemn promise. It is as good as done because I gave you my word. I want you to act as, as if the promise was fulfilled because it is as good as being fulfilled. Uh, as the writer of the book of Hebrews says, and we've mentioned many times, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. When he says, I am the father of many nations, that is confidence that God is going to keep his word. I think it helps solidify his faith. Secondly, <laughs> I think it forces Abram and uh, Sarah to go public with their faith. Oh yeah. So can you imagine you you know you're uh, you're in Walmart and uh, you know you're buying something and for the warranty they want your name and so you say oh yeah my name is Father of Many Nations. Oh wow. So what are your nations? What are they called? Well, they uh, don't really have a name yet. I, uh, oh, well, so your kids are in the midst of these. Oh, where are your kids? Well, I don't really have any kids. Um, well, how can you call yourself that? Isn't, isn't that like the perfect lead-in? Because the God called me out of Haran, and he has been faithful to me, and he made a covenant with me, and, and, I, and I firmly believe he's going to keep... I mean, that, that, that's an invitation to go public with your faith. Have you ever seen Christians afraid to go public with their faith? All the time. <laughs> if you want to have evangelism day, who shows up? Empty I got I to gotta trick them. I gotta, I, I've, I've got to <laughs> trick them. I've, I've, I have to have some other reason to have something going on. And, and then, oh, we're doing a meal distribution. Okay, we're also training you how to share the gospel. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> but this more than encourages Abram and Sarah, to share their testimony, to let people know how God has led them. The promises God has made that they are confident will be, will be followed. I mean, just, I, I think it does. It helps them go public with their faith. But that's not all God said. He said, yes, I want to change your name. But then he kind of shifted to a um, more delicate matter. Nathan, do you want to read that for us? That's uh, verses 10 through 14? Sure. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Ooh. So, um... 
You might say God's uh, expectations of Abraham have taken a sharp turn. Oh, <laughs> sad trombone. Oh, I know why my kids uh, are afraid to come over sometimes. Uh, <laughs> no, I, this is a this is a new uh, a new feature to God's covenant. I mean, He has not asked this before. Not only does He say here, "I want you to change your names," but now He says, "I want you to be circumcised." And if you or any of your children or people of your household are not circumcised, you're not part of my covenant. This is non-negotiable. <laughs> Nathan, how would you respond? If you were Abraham and God asked you at, uh, how old is he? 99? 99. Well, now I want you to be circumcised. If I was Abraham, I would say, this is about the Hagar thing, isn't it? <laughs> 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 Which is interesting that this comes right after that scene, right? It is. It's, uh, <laughs> you are now asking me to do something incredibly intimate. I have misused my sexuality, and this will be a forever sign to me and a reminder to me that I can't misuse uh, my sexuality uh, anymore, that I'm supposed to be different from all of my pagan neighbors who probably thought that, you know, the thing with Hagar was a good idea in the first place. Uh, yeah, I would, I, I would not be all that excited about this. <laughs> no. No. And you know that, uh, certainly because it's an ongoing commandment for all the people of Israel, that, uh, this isn't just about, uh, Hagar to be sure. So if this is the mark of the people of the covenant, and God says, this is the mark, then why, why circumcision? I mean, if God had asked me, you know, what kind of mark should we have? I would have had some suggestions like, <laughs> you know, how about a tattoo, right? Like, um, put that on the forehead, you know, God's child or something. That's going to hurt a lot less. Than, Maybe just uh, a sticker. Yeah, get a, a sticker even better. Uh, you know, a pin, you know, um, or uh, how about a special haircut? Like, okay, we'll all have mohawk haircuts. That's, that's not going to, you know, it'll be distinctive and it will be painless. Uh, why? Why circumcision? Any idea? I don't have any idea. Do you know, Nathan? Well, I know, you know, it's a symbol from the, in the New Testament about the separation of uh, sin from our lives, but it, it's an external symbol of an inward reality. Uh, and it's only applicable to half the population. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, as I've thought about this, a couple of things come to mind. One is it's painful. So that's obvious. So if you're not serious, don't do it. Like you're either in or you're not. And you're going to think seriously before you're willing as an adult to be circumcised. Um, just like, you know, you better think clearly, are you sure that you want to be part of God's family? It comes with lots of privileges and lots of obligations. So this is a serious commitment you're making if you want to join God's family. In the New Testament, we have baptism. Think clearly because this is a public affirmation. Of, of what you're doing, and you don't go back on that. But also, there's nothing more personal or intimate than uh, circumcision. It involves one's private parts. And it's no accident that this is central to any marriage relationship. I mean, it speaks of an intimate relationship between husband and wife, the most intimate, the most personal, relationship building thing possible comes out of that. And it's in the New Testament, the church is called the bride of Christ. I, I think this is an illusion where God is saying he wants us uh, to love him as passionately as a husband loves his wife. I don't just want you to, um, you'll offer your arm to another woman out of courtesy, just to help her down some uh, steps or out of a car. But you don't offer your private parts to anyone, anyone except your spouse. I think he's saying, I want a relationship with you that is deep and fulfilling as the best relationship that a husband and wife can enjoy. Can you think of a Old Testament prophet who understood the husband-wife relationship between God and his people? Oh, Ezekiel, he 
loved his wife, and as a prophetic sign, God said, I am going to take the delight of your eyes away from you, and mm. you are not to mourn. And when the people ask you, why aren't you mourning this wife that you loved, you are to tell them because you don't care about your relationship with God, and God is, uh, you are uh, wandered away from God, and, and, and you're not mourning the loss of that relationship, and so that's what this is a symbol of. Likewise, I think of Hosea, where uh, God said in Hosea chapter 2, in his relationship, the Lord said about his relationship with Israel, therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will betroth you to me forever. I'll betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In chapter 3, the Lord said to me, Hosea says, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Now, I, I think God wants us to have a passionate, personal relationship with him. Not an external, fear-based relationship, but I think this points to something far deeper and far more intimate in our relationship with God. He doesn't just want our arm. He wants the most personal, most intimate parts of us and for us to offer ourselves at the deepest possible level to him as well. And you know what I find striking in this chapter? In this chapter, I read in the end of chapter 17, on that very day, Abram took his wife, took his son Ishmael, and all those born in his household or bought with his money, every male in his household, and circumcised them as God told him. And Abram was 99 years old when he was circumcised. And Abraham and his son Ishmael were both circumcised on that same day. So let me tell you what I think I would have done if God had told me to have this covenant, you must be circumcised, change your name and be circumcised. I would have changed my name that day. Okay, I'll do that. But I think I'll, you know, make an appointment for later to do the circumcision thing. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to put it off. I'm going to delay. But isn't it fascinating? The text is very clear that on that same day, he said, no, no hesitation. God, I want you. I want to know you in all of your fullness. I want my faith to grow. God is asking this veteran of the faith, 24 years following God, I want you to continue to develop your relationship with me. Okay, so this text does not say we have to be circumcised today. New Testament is very clear on that. It doesn't say we have to change our name. So how can we today deepen our relationship with God? We'll do it differently externally than, than Abram did. But the principle is the same. God wants, wanted Abram to develop his faith. He wants us to. How, how can we do that? What advice would you give for ourselves and for our listeners? Well, mine's going to be simple, but it's going to be very basic. I think to follow God, you trust and you obey. And in order for you to trust, you have to know what it is you're trusting. So that would keep you in Scripture. You have to, you have to let God talk to you, and I think God talks to you through His Word. So mm -hmm. you, you get in Scripture, and then once you're in Scripture, you have to obey it. It isn't enough to know it. You have to do it. So you trust and you obey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's like internal, external, right? The internal, let's spend time with God every day, right? Whether that is through uh, music, Scripture reading, prayer, uh, reflection um, upon His Word. You, you have to do that. You have to spend time. When I don't get to spend time with my wife, I... Uh, you know, our, our relationship suffers. And when we finally get together again and we're, we're talking, it's like, wow, we haven't done this in a long time and, uh, and have a lot to catch up on. But then, you know, 
that's the external stuff. As as you were saying, Vicky, obey. I, I need to talk about him. I need to share his word with other people, whether that's my own children, my own household, uh, my neighbors, my friends, my coworkers, uh, the, the folks I meet at school. Uh, it's, it's, it's the internal, but it's also the external. I'm not going to deny my wife like, hey, are you married? Well, no. What's that on your ring uh, or on your finger? Uh, it's nothing. It's just, you know, my class ring. <laughs> right? Um, I, you know, I, well, when I was picking up the kids from school today, I was talking to one of, one of the other parents and and I was sharing with them about my our our excursion in tiling in the uh, the kitchen and <laughs> frustrations of marriage in there. Right? I referenced my wife and how appreciative I was that she was willing to drop everything on a dime and and come help with something uh, before all of the the grout dried. So I think I think it's that that like you said, Vicky, trust and obey. I think it's internal, external. You got to spend time with God, but you also have to spend time obeying His word, and part of that is sharing His love with other people. Yeah, yeah. I have found that uh, when I was writing the book Deep Preaching, that I stumbled across something that I've really found has been transformative for me, and that is that uh, the twin disciplines that I think every pastor and I think every person needs to develop are the spiritual disciplines of meditation and prayer. So just to echo, Vicki, what you and Nathan have said, I do think it starts with God's Word. And as I look at the Bible and read it and try to understand it and find the idea that God has communicated, if I take the time and meditate on it, by that the Bible means chew on it, ask questions about it and then ask god what does this mean god jesus said he told his disciples he gave us the holy spirit so that they he would the holy spirit would lead us into all truth and i believe that's what happens as we pray so as i'm meditating and i'm asking god what does this mean and he whispers back and i ask more questions i have found as i do that it has expanded to fill all of my life so it's not just what I do in the study, it's what I do in life. I'm just thinking about what is God saying and what does that mean? And God, will you help me? And uh, it means that conversations, Nathan, you're talking about that we long for with our, those wonderful long conversations with our spouses. It's having that with God on an ongoing basis. It's what Brother Lawrence called practicing the presence of Christ. Mm. It's not just devotions. It, uh, it bleeds from there into all of life and uh, and I think it really does transform us. And I do think there's a link between circumcision in the text, that deeper intimate relationship with, with God that he wants, and with um, telling people about our faith. Because when I really, really love my wife, and I do, I find myself in situations I just can't help myself but to brag about her. I want people to know how marvelous this woman is. What a gift she is, how bright she is, how helpful she is. I, I can't, it just bubbles out. I don't think evangelism is so much a methodology as I think it is a, a outpouring of a deep relationship with Christ. We just can't help but talk about our lover. And when our lover is a God, then it just kind of pours out. One person that I think fully embodied this was the um, was the apostle paul and one of my favorite passages of all is in philippians chapter 3 uh, starting at verse 7. vicky would you mind reading that for us paul's passion for christ i'd love to do that but whatever were gains to me i now consider loss for the sake of christ what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the, sur of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, yet I may gain Christ and be found in him. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings because like him, or becoming like him in his death. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. Hmm. 
like Paul, like Abraham. Let's go deeper in our relationship with God. May their passion for the Lord become our passion for the Lord. Our walk with God is not like a boring flight on a plane. It's like marriage, a journey of intimacy. So let's commit to deepening our faith every day by meditating on Scripture and obeying it every day. I trust that today's discussion of God's Word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the Word, but doers. Together, Let's bring God's Word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by sharing it on social media and telling your friends. Be sure to listen next Friday as we continue our discussion through the book of Genesis. Be sure to join us.